right, so now that we talked about the basics of Piaget and Vygotsky's theories, we're going to tackle these different skills and learn how they fit together to make the puzzle of our cognitive development. So one of the very first skills we're going to talk about is object permanence. And this is a skill that we really begin to master in infancy. Basically what this skill means is when you don't see something, it continues to exist. Believe it or not, in early infancy, we don't have a capacity to understand this. When we see an object, we understand it exists. And when we no longer see the object, we're not sure if it exists or not, or if it just completely vanishes from existence. This is why games such as Peekaboo are really fascinating to infants, because with the reemergence of it, it's the idea, oh, you still exist. Now that being said, lots of infants continue to enjoy Peekaboo even after they master object permanence, and it's more about the affect and the surprise. But between the ages of zero and four months of age, what we find is if we, we hide an object, such as hide a ball behind a curtain or under a box, infants will not even try to look where they think it is, or they won't try to reach where they think it is. They just assume it doesn't exist. They eye, their eyes don't look for it, they don't try to reach for it. And we've done this through many different habituation studies where we make an object move at a constant trajectory and then all of a sudden we make it move at a constant trajectory behind something. And as soon as it goes behind something, infant's eye gaze goes elsewhere. They assume it doesn't continue to exist. By the time we're about ages five months of age, we start to master that. And it's a very classic study. This is the idea of rolling a ball behind a curtain. And as the ball rolled behind a curtain, we could track the infant's eyes and the infants would track the ball coming out the other side of the curtain at a pretty, if it was moving at a constant velocity. We can also test this in lots of other ways. If the ball moves behind the curtain and then a bigger object emerges from outside the curtain, or if it changes velocity, or if it slows down, speeds up, shrinks in size, grows in size, then we can track with their eyes if they saw that was a predictable event or an unpredictable event. We also do fun things like if they expect the ball to bounce behind the curtain, or if they expect uh, balloons to float behind a curtain, or we can do one of my favorite ones where they have a ball and it's behind a wooden board and then the board actually goes down and squishes the ball flat against the ground. There's actually a trap door there. But we can watch the infants and see if they can track how the ball is squished against the floor, if, if that makes sense to them. Infants who do not yet have object permanence, they'll see it from this angle and they'll see the ball and they'll see the board come up. And when it goes flat against the floor, they just assume it's normal. They don't act as surprised. But once we have object permanence and they see it, it doesn't, they, they would expect for it to kind of rest here and not go all the way down. But when they see it actually squish the ball into the ground, they are pretty surprised and they look longer and we can measure that in their eye tracking. And so there's lots of different ways we tend to measure object permanence. What's really cool is even after we've obtained object permanence, we still do an error associated with this skill. And it's called the A not B error. And what happens now is if we hide an object in one location, infants will look there and they'll try and reach for it. And for instance, we could hide a ball under a little cloth or a little face cloth. And if we hide it under one spot, the infants will reach for it. But if in front of the infant with, with no manipulation and no deception, we put an object under cloth A and then move it in front of them to cloth B and we even say out loud what we're doing. Oh, we put the ball under the blue blanket. Now we move it and put it under the red blanket. The infants will look in the first spot, but not the second. And so what happens here is it might not be a problem with object permanence, but it might be a problem with a lack of inhibition or a lack of impulse control. They have a hard time sustaining attention or sustaining their memory, and they just reach for it and they go and get it. It's often considered part of our study on object permanence, but as you can see, it might have some other cognitive skills in there. So object permanence is something we tend to get pretty early on in the lifespan, but that being said, our sense of object permanence allows us to test many other things, such as causal reasoning, or the idea if we expect things to float or sink or bounce or shrink in size. Another cognitive skill we're gonna talk about that happens very early on in the lifespan is symbolism. So Piaget thought this didn't happen until the end of the sensory motor stage. We now know it happens during, but it continues to get more advanced during the pre-operational thought stage. So what symbolism is, it's the idea that you understand something represents something else. 
we can think about symbols as letters or numbers. The idea that the numeral two represents a quantity. It represents two objects that I can also make a gestural symbol with my hands. I can also make a spoken symbol by saying two, or I can have a written symbol like TWO or the numeral or even Roman numerals. And they all mean two objects. So understand those things all represent the same thing is actually pretty complicated. And so there's a couple stages we have to do before we get there. We have to become familiar with the symbols and then start to associate them with things. Once we get the ball rolling, however, it's amazing what we can use symbols for. Children are really good at using symbols for pretend play. This is the idea if they have a dollhouse, they understand that the doll bed is not a real bed, but it represents a real bed. And they understand the doll's not a real person, but the doll's nose represents their nose and their hands represent their hands. They understand that a picture of a flower is not a real flower, but it represents a flower. And some very classic studies in this area, back when we used more landline phones, were about the banana phone. And this idea that a toddler who uses a banana and holds it up to their face as if it's a telephone is actually doing some pretty complex cognitive skills. They're understanding that it's a phone, but it's also a banana. They're also inhibiting their behavior and they're not eating the banana while they're pretending it's a phone. And it's actually really complicated. All this symbolism can actually help us for much more advanced things like language and literacy development later on, but it can also help us with things like map reading. Very early on, around four-year-olds, we can start to read maps, especially maps that are uh, aerial views of rooms that we're in, where we draw a bed or we draw a dresser or a doorway. We can read those maps. And as we get older, we can read more advanced maps, like a street map with a river and a park and some roads, and it gets more complicated from there out. So symbolism is a really important skill that can help us with many other things. After symbolism, we're going to talk about memory and attention. And this is a huge area of development. We could have a whole course just on memory and attention. But briefly, some of the things we're interested in are things like selective attention versus sustained attention. So selective attention is the idea that if we ask a child to listen to us and not watch TV, can they do it? Some of them may choose not to, but if they're actually motivated, can they select what they pay attention to? We can do this in laboratory studies where they're watching something, but then there's also music playing that's not matching up to it. And what do they attend to the most, the visual representation or the audio representation of what's going on? Versus sustained attention rather than selective attention is the idea how long can they hold their attention? How long can they hold their attention on a task? How long can they hold their attention on listening to a story or watching a movie? And, and this is something that increases over time. As we learned about in temperament, some infants have a longer attention span right from the get-go than other children. And some of this has to do with the idea of cognitive load. For instance, very young children, if we were to give them a task, let's say, take your shoes off and then go wash your hands, that might sound straightforward. For you, that might be easy to listen to, but really young one and a half year old, two year old children that have the gross motor ability to take their shoes off would not be able to hold that all in their head. You would need to remind them, okay, come on in the door, take your shoes off. Yeah, take that one off. Now take that one off. They need lots more prompting. And then once they finally take the shoes off, you say, go to the washroom, turn on the sink, wash your hands. They need help holding all that in their mind's eye and holding that in their cognitive load. Versus by the time they're three or four, you could probably say, can you take your shoes off and wash your hands? And as they're taking their shoes off, they might forget what the other piece was, but one prompt might be enough. Compare that to someone who's five or six, and at this point you could say, can you take your shoes off, line them up by the door, then go wash your hands and refill the soap? you can make it much more complicated. And so this is something that continues to grow and our ability to understand these instructions, it happens individually, but it does definitely increase as we get older. However, one type of memory that rapidly decreases all of a sudden as we get older in the preschool years is our infantile amnesia. So what's really fascinating is everybody's individual on this, but at some point, whether they're two or three or four, they have a hard time remembering things even from a month prior. If a child is particularly verbal at 18 months of age or 24 months of age, they may be able to talk about and remember things and display a memory of where things are from three months prior or even six months prior. And when they're three, they may especially be able to articulate memories that they had when they were two. But somewhere around two and a half or three or maybe a bit later for some kids, all of a sudden those memories become very blurry. And it might be the idea that right around their fourth birthday, they could no longer talk about things that happened when they were three and a half, when just a week prior they could. 
We're not completely sure what happens here, but a couple theories suggest that perhaps the way that our brain reorganizes itself around this age makes those memories a lot harder to tap into. It's the idea through synaptic pruning and through brain maturity, those infantile memories are less mature. And as our brain rapidly matures around that age, we have a harder time tapping into those memories. Another theory is the idea that because our memories were more non-literate or more visual-based and less language-based, as we become a more language-based person, it's harder for us to re-examine those memories. And finally, there's just the theory that sometimes those memories are encoded in a way that they're not meant to last. That can be really frustrating for a parent who knows their three and a half child remembered everything back to when they were one and a half, but all of a sudden at their fourth birthday, now they can't remember being three and a half. And it can be really particular and really surprising, but it is pretty typical for the course. And then finally, we have to talk about multitasking. Multitasking is something that we don't actually do, it's a myth. And when you are going between two different tasks, you are actually going between them. You're never doing two tasks at once, even if it's in nanoseconds. And so if you're watching television and working on homework or texting someone and cooking, you're never actually doing two things at once. You might be quickly pivoting between them. But this illusion of multitasking is something we do become better at as we get older, but it is something that tends to burn us out, especially in adolescence, when we're trying to put too much on our plate and trying to multitask on too much. Now, of course, there's lots of diversity in terms of attention, and so I do want to point out that some kids just have a much harder time sustaining their attention and selecting their attention on the desired things and holding those instructions in their cognitive load. And so especially kids on the ADHD spectrum, the attention deficit hyperactivity spectrum, might have a harder time with this particular cognitive skill. Another cognitive skill that children with ADHD may struggle with is the skill of executive function or inhibition. And so what we mean by inhibition, we talked about it in the last unit as well, this is really the ability to inhibit your thoughts, to kind of put a filter on and stop and pause before things go. And so we see this a lot in the Stroop task. You might be familiar with the adult Stroop task. This is where we have colors that are written in fonts that don't match what the word says. So for instance, you might have the letters R-E-D, but the font is not red. The font might be purple or blue. And you have to try and not read what the word says, but say the color of the font. When we become especially literate in adolescence and adulthood, we read things almost instantaneously. So the Stroop task is hard for us because we want to read what the word says and not say the color of the font. For infants and toddlers, we can do a different type of Stroop task, and this is often called the day and night. And so what happens here is we ask them to say night when they see a sun and ask them to see day when they see a moon. Now this brings up the importance of what we call a validity check. A validity check is the idea that we actually are measuring inhibition and not something else. So for order for this to work, we have to make sure that at this age they know what night is and they know what sun is. So we'd have to do a separate trial where they, they understand what is moon and what is sun. So what we start off doing is they might have to know what one is and what the other is, and then we switch it. So they have to say night when they see sun and day when they see moon. This is really hard for them to do. We can also do things with white versus black cards, and they have to say white when they see black and black when they see white, and that type of inhibition is really, really difficult. We can also measure this in the classic marshmallow task. This is the idea that if you place a marshmallow or a candy down in front of a young child and say, you can eat this one marshmallow, but I'm gonna leave for five minutes. And when I come back, if the marshmallow is still here, you get two marshmallows instead of one. What happens is really young kids around the ages of two or three, they can't wait, they can't wait. They're gonna eat the marshmallow right away versus a five-year-old is going to be able to wait. So we can see a big change in this skill over the pre-operational thought period.